so this preacher had worked on his sermon all week long and worked hard on it, got it ready to go. And Saturday night he retopped it so it was all easy to read. But during the night his dog chewed his sermon up. <laughs> He didn't notice it until it was time to go to church the next morning. Too late to do anything about it then. When he got in the pulpit, he said, I had a nice sermon prepared for you this morning, but my dog chewed it up. I'm going to have to rely on the inspiration of the Lord today, but I promise to do better next week. Okay, that's a joke. Uh -huh. title of my message today is Contend for the faith. We're in a series called Contending for the Faith. And today is Contend for the Faith. We're in back in the book of Jude, verses 3 through 7. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we get into your word today, Father, as, as we see what you have for us, show me. Guide me, lead me on what to preach and how to get the points across the way you want them, Lord. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the book of Jude. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. So we're going to begin with verse 3. It says, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that for that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now he starts off with the word beloved. Now what the word beloved actually means here is God's beloved children, uh, children. It means that we are loved of God. Not just by God, but we're loved of God. All right, we are his beloved. If we are believers, if Jesus is in our heart, we are beloved of God. All right, and he goes on and talks about our common salvation. Now, he had intended to write to them about salvation, but when he learned about the false teachers that had come in, he changed his direction, told them to contend for the faith. Now, what does it mean to contend for the faith? According to what Paul told Timothy, it means to fight the good fight. According to what Luke said, it means to strive to enter through the narrow door. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians, it means to exercise self-control. According to what Paul said in Philippians, it means to stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Of the gospel. So what does it mean to contend for the faith? It means to stand against all who undermine it. It means to stand against all who undermine it. Now, Jude is talking about the Christian faith, and he is writing to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And Jude is his concern because the faith, the Christian mess, the Christian message, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ was being attacked by people who had come in who were false teachers. These people were teaching things that were they were dangerous heresies. Dangerous heresies. Jude urges his readers to contend for the faith against anybody against all those who come in to undermine and erode it. In the Greek, it would read more like contend earnestly for the faith. Since this faith was and is entrusted to all believe, believe, believers and not just to the Christian leaders of the church, we are to contend, all of us, earnestly for the faith, to defend the truth of Jesus Christ. And since this faith was entrusted once for all, Jude intends to, to, to stand against those who claim to receive a new revelation of truth. 
We are to contend earnestly for the faith once for all. Verse 4. It says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So Jude tells them to contend for the faith in verse 3, and he goes right into verse 4, and he says that certain people have crept in unnoticed. This is the way it works. These people want to creep in. They want to come into your fellowship, and they want to make you believe they're good. That what they believe is what you believe. And then as they gain your trust, well, then they begin to spew the garbage they really believe. They come in and act all nice while behind the scenes are getting people in the church to believe them. They love to do things and get people together for a Bible study outside the church. They can teach almost the truth. And see, that's what gets so many believers into trouble is somebody comes in and they teach just enough of the truth so you go, well, yeah, they're, they're really solid. And then you find out down the road they weren't as solid as you think. And so Judas saying, look out, man. These people are coming in. And they'd already come into the church and they were spreading things that weren't right. They had a, a new revelation from God. Okay? When these people come in, before long you have discord in the church. Before long the real trouble begins. These people are usually just enough charismatic that you're like, man, I really like to hear what they say. I love listening to them. And then they convince just enough of the key people in the church, trouble always takes place. Look at, in Titus 1, 16, it says, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. In Acts 20, verse 30, it says, And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. You see, false teachers aren't new to our day. False teachers were around then. They were there, it says, those who long ago were designated for this condemnation. These people were written about long before. These people were talked about. These people come in and pervert the word of God. These false teachers love to get people on their side, right? 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no, one, and no one wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his ser servants also disguise themselves as servants of right righteousness. Their end will correspond with their deeds. Jesus foretold about these people in Matthew 7, 15. He said, Beware of false pro prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He said to be on the watch, to be alert. He said these people will slip in. False teachers love to use just enough scripture to make you think they're sincere. That's why it's so important that we know God's word, all of God's word, not just bits here and there. We need to understand what God's word is saying, what it means. Let's go to verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the, out of the land of Egypt, of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now Jude reminds them 
that they know the truth, that they have been confused, they have been lied to. He says, you know what I'm saying is true. Now, this verse may confuse some because it says that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And we think, well, wait a minute, Jesus wasn't there. He didn't come along until the book of Matthew. Jesus wasn't there when the people of Israel were delivered from Egypt. Remember what I've said in the past, Jesus was there when everything was created. He was there all through the Old Testament. He's that thin red line from Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation. In the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through, th 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and He was there in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus was there. So when Jude says that that Jesus saved the people out of the land of Egypt and afterwards destroyed those who did not believe, he was being correct. You remember the children of Israel were in bondage. Remember? They were slaves in Egypt and they were crying out to God and God sent Moses and he sent the plagues and he sent the first Passover. When the death angel came and passed over those who had the blood of the lamb on the door, door post. Then they left Egypt, went to the Red Sea. God parted the waters of the Red Sea. They walked across some dry land. Then when Pharaoh's troops tried to go across and get them, the waters fell upon them and drowned them. They traveled to the promised land. And they get there and they overlook the promised land. And Moses sends 12 spies, one from each tribe. And the 12 men go across and gone 40 days. And when they come back, they give their report. The land is wonderful. It's better than we were told. It is just you would believe everything. But 10 men, they said, wait a minute. We can't do what God said to do. These men are mighty men. And there's giants. And why? They'll just crush us like a bug if we go in. We cannot do what God said do. Two of the men, Joshua and Caleb, said, let's go. God said, take it. We're ready to take it. We can do it because look what God's already done for us. This is nothing for God. But the ten persuaded the people not to enter. And God turned them back into the wilderness. They wandered around for 38 more years until that unbelieving generation was dead, except for Joshua and Caleb. They were still there. They were still there. The spies, they brought back the report, but 10 convinced the people not to follow God. Ten of them convinced the people of Israel that maybe God really didn't know what he was talking about. In the wilderness, Israel, in unbelief, was destroyed. It's an example of what God does, and that God does judge apostates. And this is an example of apostasy. A departure from the faith. They departed from the from the whole basis on which they had left Egypt. I mean, seriously, if you had been in bondage in Egypt and God delivered you and you left a million strong, and the people of Egypt gave you gold and silver and jewels and just said, Man, take this and go. And they walked out, and the Bible says this is one of the most amazing parts. That of that million people, there's not one person lame or sick. God had them all ready to go. And they go, and Pharaoh says, uh, I'm going to go get them. He sends his troops, and God puts a pillar of fire between them. Remember that? They get to the Red Sea, and what happens? God parts the Red Sea, they go across. Egypt tries, they get drowned. 
I mean, seriously, all these things, if you want to God do this, wouldn't you say, let's go across. Let's take this land that was promised to us. It's the same land God gave Abraham. That's why it's the promised land. Okay? Now just think about this for a minute. The ten said no. The two said let's go. God let them wander around in the wilderness until that generation all died off. Except Joshua and Caleb. The only two who believed God. They were still alive. They were the ones who said, let's go. God will give it to us. Now, this is our first example of apostasy in the past. The ten spies convincing the people not to believe God. All right? Jude verse 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, there's a truth right here that we, we, we don't see with such clarity probably anywhere else in God's word. We are told there will be a judgment of angels. Sometime in the past, the angels, some of them didn't stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. Now, God created angels with a free will, but angels do not reproduce like we do. Therefore, they did not inherit the sinful na nature as humans do. Now, each angel is created by God with a free will, now, some of these spiritual creatures were caught up in a rebellion in heaven, and now they are kept in chains. 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. All right? So apparently, these fallen angels were divided into two groups. Some that was so bad that God said, you're going to be in prison in chains and gloomy darkness forever. And the other group that wasn't as bad is now they're now under the rule of Satan. And they're the ones who are messing with us every day. Okay? In today's world, we see people get all caught up in the occult or satanic things or, or demons or devils or whatever. And it seems to be just in everything anymore. And it always comes to the part in the movies or the books that this bad evil and some person is strong enough to to control it or to destroy it but that's not realistic because Jesus is the one who destroyed it Jesus is the one who took the power from Satan Jesus is the one who rules alright so today's world way too many people are, are, are caught up Satan is already defeated. He and his demons don't have any power over us, those of us who are blood-bought, Bible-believing, spirit-filled children of God. Amen. We will judge angels. Does that sound weird to you? The Bible says we will judge angels. Now, I, you know, some people want to argue this point, but 1 Corinthians 6.3 says, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? You know, if we can't settle things between us as believers, how do we expect to be able to judge angels? Did you know that Believers will judge the world and angels. What we get to do in this life is practice. We get to settle things between us as believers. Instead of going to court, right? Sometimes we have no choice. Sometimes we're taken to court. And God sees us through. Sometimes we get so concerned with looking bad 
or we get so concerned with somebody disrespecting us or even doing us wrong that we end up making the church look bad by the way we act. We need to get along. We need to work together. We need to love and respect each other and not worry if we're being respected, but worry about respecting each other. These angels did not stay where they were supposed to and did not do what they were supposed to be doing, and they were and are being punished. They rebelled against God and were put in bondage. Our sin is a rebellion against God, and we need to make sure that we are where we need to be with God. Now, this is our second example of apostasy in the past. Jude verse 7. Now, I'm going to just tell you, I didn't write verse 7. God did. Okay? Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment, a punishment of eternal fire. Now, this is church. This is church. Can't can talk. <laughs> I got my tongue in from my eye teeth and couldn't see what I was trying to say. This is Jude's third example of apostasy in the past. He has mentioned Israel and their unbelief, mentioned the angels who didn't stay where they were supposed to, and now the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Now, these cities were so completely judged that they are probably buried under the Dead Sea today. That's, what I, that's where I think they are, is under the Dead Sea. God destroyed these people because they defiled their flesh. They were given over to homosexuality. The word sodomy comes from the town Sodom. Okay? Now, what they were doing in God's sight is gross immor immorality and the vilest sin of all. The fact that God judged men in the past for sins of sensuality ought to be a warning to us today. It should be a warning to our generation today. God will judge any civilization that moves too far in this direct, direct direction. And I just wonder how close we really are. So why is homosexuality the vilest sin of all? Because it goes against one of the very first laws and the most basic law that God set up called the law of reparosity. That's harder to spell than it is to say. This is the law of sowing and reaping, the law that everything reproduces after its own kind. Okay? If you plant corn, you get corn. If you plant cotton, you get cotton. Bovine creates a bovine. Humans create other humans. Right? Everything reproduces after its own kind. You don't plant cotton and go, man, this is great corn. Right? You don't plant corn and it gets up nine foot tall and has big old bowls of cotton on it. It doesn't work that way. Everything reproduces after its own kind. Right? It's the way God set things up. And when man says, I don't need a woman, I'm going to choose another man, this flies in the face of God and it goes directly against one of the basic laws of God. As I said, I didn't write this. God did, okay? People like to say, well, God made me the way I am. That's always a popular argument. Well, God made you male or he made you female, and he made you to reproduce, and it takes a male and a female to do that. People like to blame God for the way they are, but we get to choose the way we act and what we do and besides that, it's God who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins so we don't have to stay the way we are. Why would God make you into something that he said is detestable 
Answer is, he wouldn't. He's not going to do that. Some like to argue this is just Old Testament. And that's old and we're New Testament. It doesn't apply today. Really? Jude 7 says that they indulge in sexual immorality and pursue a natural desire. The unnatural desire part means that men were pursuing other men and women pursuing other women. The way a man should pursue a woman and a woman pursue a man. Now you got to remember Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities, the two angels showed up and Abraham talked to them and then God tells Abraham what they're going to do. And Abraham goes to bed and says, what? what if we could find this many believers? Would you destroy God? said, no. And he gets God down to 10 believers. God could not find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities around them. Could not find 10 righteous. You see, I believe that's really what's holding judgment back on us today is because we have believers, strong believers today. Remember what happened? The two angels showed up to get Lot and his wife and his daughters out and they showed up and told him it's time to get out and the men of the city started trying to get these two angels to have their way with them. That's what, that's what God's word says. And Lot says, come in here. Come in here quick. He brings them inside. He even offers up his two daughters to these men. They're like, we don't want girls. We want guys. And so then the angels strike them all blind so they can't see what they're doing. They couldn't even find the door. And then he says, it's time for you to get out. Don't even look back. And we all know as they're leaving, Lot's wife looks back and turns to a pillar of salt. And these cities, God rained down sulfur and fire so hot it utterly destroyed everything. Utterly destroyed everything. That's Old Testament. Okay, Leviticus 18.22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Okay, that's Old Testament too. But Romans isn't. Romans 1.26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchange natural relations for those who are contrary to, na to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. God says don't do it. God has set his laws up from the beginning, male and female, and nowhere does God say that homosexuality is all right. I don't care how people try to twist God's word, nowhere does God say it's okay. God hasn't changed his mind. God didn't say, well, maybe it's all right. As long as you love each other. Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. That means he has not, he is not, and he will not. I, the Lord, do not change. If God hasn't changed, who has? We live in a world today where we're almost afraid to even say anything about this for fear of retaliation. We see it everywhere we look. TV shows, movies, and they just put it in there for who knows what reason. It's been pushed on us, been pushed on our kids. Christians have bought into the lie that if we say anything against it, we're not showing love. And as I've said before, if we don't tell the truth of God and His Word and His salvation, we are not showing love. We didn't show them love by telling them about Jesus and His saving grace. That's love. That's love. We can speak the truth of God's law and do it in a loving way. 
It isn't just a choice of lifestyle. It is sin, and sin will take us to hell. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Without Jesus, there is no peace. It is, the only, it is only through Jesus Christ that we can have any peace at all. Let me just tell you this. We get to make our own choice. But when we stand in front of God, we will not be able to argue our way into heaven for the choices that we've made. We won't be able to convince God that we are right and he is wrong. We will stand in front of God, and He is the ultimate judge who knows everything about us. Everything. We need to make sure this morning that we're on God's side. We need to make sure this morning that our life lines up with God and His Word. After you die, it's too late. It's too late. Let's all pray. Father, as we come to this time of our service, Lord, where we've heard your word, Father, is anyone here who needs to repent and get where they need to be with you? Father, right now is that time. Right now is the time we need to be doing that. So I ask you, Lord, to show us, send your Holy Spirit to work on us. Father, I give you complete permission to send your Holy Spirit and do what needs to be done this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. As we begin to sing, it's time for us to do business with God. Maybe what you heard this morning upset you. Maybe it made you mad. Ask God why. Ask God why.